Get ready for a special edition of The Ed Bernstein Show. Today, Ed's guest is Congressman and Civil Rights Leader John Lewis. I'd like to welcome back Congressman John Lewis. It's been since 1987 that you were have been a congressman. Is that, does that make you the longest serving congressman? Well, on the Democratic side, I believe I'm number nine in seniority. I've been around for a while. Mm-hmm. Who's, the, who's the oldest congressman? The oldest congressperson we just lost, the oldest person hey. who came in my class, Louis Slaughter, this wonderful, unbelievable woman, was born in Kentucky. Her father worked in the coal mines. She went off and got a great education, the first person in her family to go to college, the same way I'm the first person in my family to go off to college. And she moved to New York, became a biologist, and ran for office for the state legislature, and got elected to Congress in, in 1986. Well, so, I mean, this is now 40, 40 plus years. That 30, 30 plus years. 30 plus years. Do my math right. And in those 30 years, you've seen a lot of changes. And you've seen a lot of changes just in our country since the days of the Freedom Riders. If Dr. King were to be alive today, would, would he be disappointed? Would it be a mixed bag for him? Would he be happy about what our country looks like today? For Dr. King, I think it would be a mixed bag. Mm-hmm. He would be very pleased that we could come so far, that we made some unbelievable changes. But he would be disappointed to see we still have the scars and stains of resistance. He would be disappointed to know that we now live in a country where the person in the White House would say something like, we have good people on both sides during what happened in Virginia. Mm -hmm. He would say we still have a distance to go before we lay down the burden of race. That the scars and stains of racism are still deeply embedded in American society and we have work to do. When you compare race relations in the United States compared to a country like England, what do you see to be the the largest difference? Well, um, I think England has some issues and some problems. But here we try to sweep the issues of race under the American rug in some dark corner. We don't want to confront it head on. And we have people in high places in America today that want to take us back to another time and another period. But I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic that the young people, the children, would not let us go back. These young men and women, many of them are in high school, in colleges, they will help us get there. And you think some of this is uh, motivated by, by the gun violence and the incidents of this year in the high schools? Is that what you're referring to, mobilizing young people? I have not seen anything like this since the 60s. When you have hundreds and thousands and millions of young people that are pushing us and they're using social media to inform people and they are mobilizing both men and women. And that's why we have so many women preparing to run for office this year. The, I mean, you lived this in the, in the, in the 60s. You were one of those younger people that was mobilized in the 60s. What is the most important thing to get young people mobilized? Because quite honestly, it's been disappointing since the 60s. Well, we always have, I think, in America, when a group come along and then you skip uh, uh, maybe a, a, an age group or mm-hmm. skip a, 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 generation. A, a generation, that's what it is. And, and then you come back. And some political leaders come along or some force come along and say, you must stand up, you must speak up, you must speak out. And these young people of this generation, they're hearing those voices. They're reading the literature of the civil rights movement. 
They're watching the films, the videos, and they will be better leaders. They will be what I call and what Dr. King would call uh, headlights rather than tail lights. And I, I tell these young people uh, what I've been telling myself and what I've been telling my colleagues in the Congress. When you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have to speak up and speak out. You have to get in what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up in rural Alabama during the 40s and the 50s, and we see those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women. I would ask my mother and my father, my grandparents, my great grandparents, why? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way. Don't get in trouble. But Rosa Parks and Dr. King inspired me to get in trouble good trouble, necessary trouble, and I've been getting in trouble ever since. You know, I got arrested 40 times during the 60s. And beaten. And beaten, yeah. left bloody, left unconscious. I thought I was going to down that bridge. And since being in Congress the past 30 years, I got arrested another five times. And I'm probably going to get arrested again before I leave the Congress. Because you have to say that we cannot be at home with what we see. And of course, you've been uh, referred to as the conscience of uh, of the House, and I, and I was looking, you know, at some of the past and present caucuses and committees that you've served on, and it, the list was was just mind boggling to me. Uh, co chair of Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease, Congressional Structured Settlements Caucus, Black Caucus, Progressive Caucus, Prevention t uh, Task Force, Healthcare Caucus, Iran, Human Traffic Trafficking, Intellectual Property, tar Turkey. I mean, I, I goes on and on. I'm scanning my phone. There must be a uh, hundred different caucuses that you've been involved in. And of course, you're on the, uh, the Ways and Means uh, Committee, which is one of the most important committees in Congress. What exactly is a caucus, and how does it differ from a committee? Well, a caucus is not something necessarily sanctioned by the House, mm -hmm. but a group of members come together. We meet, we plan, and we take, we take uh, positions. Uh, we used to have a, a caucus to protect journalists. Uh, all around the world, and, and something happened there. Uh, we would issue a statement. We would go to the floor and say something. Uh, but it's a lot of work. We, we have an arts caucus. I'm a strong supporter of the arts. Uh, we need music. We, we need drama. And uh, if it hadn't been for music, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings. Mm. Music have created a sense of togetherness, a sense of solidarity. And when you've been beaten, arrested, or taken off to jail, you just sing a song. Dr. Dr. King would have been happy about our new Pulitzer Prize winner? I, I think Dr. King would have been uh, pretty pleased. Yes. Yeah, talk about the, the, the influence of, of music. You know, it's, uh, you know, that's come a long way you know, for hip hop to be part of Pulitzer Prize. And it's amazing to me. It's yeah. amazing to me. But uh, I tell you, sometimes you didn't have anything to pin on but music. When we were marching from Selma to Montgomery, mm -hmm. there was a young man from Los Angeles who had a guitar. He just started playing a song, making up the words, improvising, saying, pick him up, lay him down, all the way from Selma town. <laughs> And you, those words, you st I mean, that's what music does. It, you can remember the words all these years later. We're marching today to dramatize to the nation, dramatize to the world, that hundreds and thousands of Negro citizens of Alabama, but particularly here in the Blightville area, denied the right to vote. That the sheriff of Selma and Dallas County had requested that all white men over the age of 21 to come down to the courthouse that Saturday night to be deputized to become part of his posse. We just kept walking. We come to the highest point on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Down below, we see a sea of blue Alabama State Troopers. A man by the name of John Cloud 
identified himself and said, I'm Major John Cloud of the Alabama State Troopers. He's detrimental to your safety to continue this march, and I'm saying that this is an unlawful march. This was an unlawful march. It would not be allowed to continue. You are ordered to disperse, go home, or go to your church. Disperse and return to your homes or to your church. I said, Major, may I have a word? Is that would be no word. You saw these men putting on their gas masks. He said, troopers advance. Troopers here, advance. They came toward us. Beating us with nightsticks. Tramping us with horses. Releasing tear gas. What's recently happened, uh, I know you were in Philadelphia a while back, and uh, in a Starbucks there had an, an issue where um, they asked a couple of um, African-American gentlemen to leave, actually waiting for a, a friend. Uh, Starbucks kind of known for that. Starbucks has reacted in taking um, a day of closing their, their, all their stores in the country and using it for, for um, training of their employees. Um, are you happy with that response? Well, I think... Starbucks is doing the right thing. Uh, I wish other places of business and in the private sector would follow. There's not any room in our society for racist action. I, I feel somewhat sorry for the person who called the police officials. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Why a, is that? Yeah. Well, he probably just acted without even thinking. There's a Starbucks located on Capitol Hill, less than a block from where I live. And I see people coming in all the time, just sitting, reading, or doing their homework or doing something. Right. And they're not necessarily shopping. Um, we must set example uh, for all Americans uh, that don't be so quick. Right, but as a, as a company, you think that they reacted properly? I mean, obviously, you, as a company, I mean, you don't sanction every one of your employees' actions. So you don't think it's an institutional issue with this? Uh, I, I don't think no. this is institutional. Yeah. I, I think this is the act on behalf of one employee. One person, yeah. And uh, well, I had made a list of things I wanted to talk to you about. You, you mentioned the women in Congress. This year we have a record number of women running for Congress. It's two, over 200, right? Well, I, I think it's, uh, if you put the women running on both sides, right. I think it's closer to 400 women wow. that are running for office mm -hmm. uh, for Congress. But there are many women running for the State House, the State Senate, and other local positions. How do you expect that to change? You know, it's, I mean, to me, it sounds like, uh, okay, women are, have, you know, you know have some greater intuition than men, they have greater patience. I mean, there's a lot of great characteristics, generally speaking, of women. But oftentimes, they get into politics and become part of, the, part of the machine. Well, I truly believe that a new breed of people are running for office. Uh, a new breed of women, a new breed of, of young people, they will be warriors. They would be fighters. They're coming from a, a different world. Um, and they're not coming to stay like so many of us have stayed. They will make a mark, and then they will go into something else. What, what's your feeling about, when you say stay, what, what's your feeling about term limits? Well, we have term limits in, in a real sense in, in the Congress, especially in the House. You can serve a term of two years, mm -hmm. and you go before the voters. So the voters can re-elect you, or they can mm -hmm. uh, de-elect you. In the Senate, you know, you can stay uh, six years. And some other positions around the country, it's two years or four years. There seems to be a lot of talk about the lack of a democratic um, front runner, There's somebody who can lift the party, who can lead the party, who can take on specific issues that the Democratic Party stands for and not just against Trump. 
Are there people that you see within the party that you have, you know, at, at least optimism that, that these people could become those leaders? I see several young men and young women uh, that can get out there and, and, and lead and be ready uh, in 2020 uh, to lead us to a great victory and bring the country together. I don't want to get into calling names because mm -hmm. I may leave someone out, right. but I, I think we're going to have a, a great feel of, of people. Right. Are some of those people people who have already run, run for president in the last election, uh, in the primary? There, there could be uh, one or two people uh, who ran before, mm -hmm. but there's so many smart and gifted young men and women. They're black, they're white, they're Latino, and they're Asian American mm -hmm. uh, that are ready. Uh, I don't think we're going to have a, a like of... Uh, people to get out there and offer themselves. And they're going to come from all parts of our country. We were talking earlier, prefaced, about uh, the need for new leadership, for young leadership. And it's almost ironic that here you are, one of the elders of Congress, having served, you know, 30 years. And, um, and it's almost uh, paradoxical that you, you know, are advocating younger, new faces. Well, you know, I've been around for a while. But it, I may be old in terms of age, and I'm 78 now, but I'm young at heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get out there and, and march with the women, with the high school students, the college students. And, uh, you know, whether I'm in the Congress or out, I will continue to be young at heart and encourage young people. Uh, I've been supporting some young people 24 and 25 years old. We need them. We, we need their sense of uh, the future. We need the vitality. We, we need the vigor. We need people who can stand up and speak up and speak out and be unafraid, to be brave and bold and courageous. You're here speaking at um, a Toro University event. Toro University is a medical school that we have here in Nevada and have branches and other cities. You don't hear much about the Affordable Care Act anymore. I mean, it seemed to be, you know, the hot button during the election, during the first several months of the, of the administration. It seems to be silence about it now. Why is that? Well, I think we don't have in the Congress the sense of commitment and dedication uh, on the part of the majority party. And we didn't have the votes in the Congress on the Democratic side to protect the Affordable Care Act. We take the House back. We take the Senate back. Uh, we will stand up. We will speak up. We will speak out. And even if I'm not there uh, for another two years or four years, there will be members coming along. Uh, the Affordable Care Act was a good thing. And we did not, we need it now more than ever before. So it will come back in some form. And the other, the other big issue was guns, and it's been a big issue during this entire administration as it was during the Obama administration. Um, how optimistic are you, if at all, that Congress is going to pass some meaningful? Um, new laws regarding uh, background checks or assault weapons? I am very hopeful, very optimistic. Do you have to wait for the next Congress, or are you but, hopeful on this one? Not with this Congress so much, because we don't have the votes. But we will continue to speak up and speak out. We will continue to engage in nonviolent protests, similar to the one that we had two years ago, where we occupied the floor, the well of the House, for more than 26 hours. These young people, these students are pushing us, and we need to be pushed. We must not forget what's been happening to so many of our school children, to so many children and young people in the inner city. Almost every single day, there's some form of gun violence in some parts of our country. 
It's people are not able to sit out on their front porches. Right. I'm not free to, to go to school without being afraid of gun violence, or go to a synagogue, or a mosque, or, or, or go to a church. We have to do something, and we need to do it now. How many more people will lose their lives because of gun violence, will be injured? Do you think it would be an easier to, to work state to state or work nationally on these kind of issues? I, I think we got to work on, on both fronts. Mm -hmm statewide as well as nationwide. Paul Ryan is leaving. Um, were you surprised that he wasn't running for re-election? I was not surprised that uh, Speaker Ryan made a decision uh, not to run for re-election. Uh, it's, it's very hard and it's very difficult uh, to be ahead of a party that is so divided in so many different ways. So many of their members are leading. Uh, they just had enough. Do you not find the Democrats um, divided in that regard? No, uh, Democratic members, for the most part, uh, are staying together on some of the great and big issues. Uh, we're probably going to get new leadership and uh, younger leadership mm -hmm. uh, that will lead us as we go through the midterms and get ready for the uh, presidency uh, in, uh, in two years. Do you get a sense as you travel around the country that people are just uh, frustrated with some senators, some congressmen who are just not, who during the campaign were criticizing Trump after the election, were criticizing him, it said some horrible, I mean, Ted Cruz, for, for instance, said some horrible things about Trump. Now they seem to be okay with them? Well, I think the great majority of the American people uh, feel that we, we must do something, and we must do something now. There's more attention toward uh, participating in state, and local, and national election, because they'll say, how, how did this happen? Well, maybe I should have got out there and, and voted. Uh, we cannot let this happen again. And I think a lot of people are embarrassed about the state of things. Uh, I think people think the rest of the world is laughing at us. Have we lost our way? Uh, that we must do something. You know, I, I think people are really going to make a decision that something that happened in 016 must never, ever happen again. You represent the uh, the 5th District of Georgia. Uh, by and large, it's Atlanta, correct? Which is, by the way, the busiest airport in the world? Is it? Yes, it's the, As they say, right? Atlanta. Well, it is. It's the uh, uh, busy commercial airport in the world. Uh, and sometimes I go through that airport so many times, uh, I, I feel like maybe I should have a condo or maybe an apartment there. Uh, I see it meets hundreds and thousands of people going through there. And it's very hard for me to go through airports, like the Atlanta Airport, or the airport in Las Vegas, or the airport in Los Angeles or Washington, D.C., where everybody want to stop and, and, and take a picture. And I have to say, I got to make my flight. I got to make my flight. <laughs> hey, it happened to you walking up here at the, at, at the hotel in Las Vegas. I mean, it seemed like everybody, you walk past some tables, uh, didn't matter what anybody's race or age or geographical location were, they all kind of recognized you and, and speak with you with uh, great respect and admiration from five years old to uh, a bunch of ladies. What were they playing on that uh, card table? I don't know, my I, John I, or I'm something not, like I'm that. I'm not I so sure what they were playing. <laughs> yeah. It right. seemed like they were having fun. Yeah. But I, I also, uh, we talked earlier about um, the history of Georgia. I mean, it had a great democratic history. Um, there was majority, majority of the 20th century, you had two Democratic uh, uh, senators in Georgia. Now you have two Republican senators. Uh, but you seemed optimistic about the future of Georgia. I'm very hopeful, very optimistic about the future of Georgia. There are more and more people migrating to Georgia, and there are more and more young people and, and college graduates uh, from the different colleges and universities throughout the state 
they're remaining there. They're staying there. And I think Georgia is going to catch up with the rest of the country. Uh, the last Senate ele election in Alabama, mm -hmm. it was the college towns. Uh, it was the African-American women that came out and voted to a heavy degree. Uh, then they even voted for Obama. And you have all of these people coming together, mm -hmm. and Georgia is going to change. You know, there's a lot of change with uh, marijuana around, the, around the, the country. Some states have made it medical, some have made it recreational. And everybody talks about the health benefits and, and uh, the civil liberties part of it. But there's another component of that, and it's the criminal justice um, components. Um, we had, a, in Nevada, our legislature passed a law to, uh, to seal the records of those um, convicted of uh, minor possession of marijuana. Because if you possess it in 2018, you're certainly free to do it. If you possess it in 2015, all of a sudden you have a criminal record. You have a criminal record, can't vote, can't get a job. Um, then you know you're susceptible to doing things that are that are shady. Let's face it, people have to eat. So um, I know during the Obama administration and Eric Holder was an advocate of this. You're an advocate of changing that criminal justice system with these crimes of possession, these nonviolent crimes, um, how successful do you feel that may get? I'm convinced it will get done. We will be successful. It's time for us to go forward mm -hmm. and become part of the 21st century uh, and not punish people because they had a smoke, uh, a joint. Uh, a few days ago, I was walking down a street in Washington, D.C., and there was two guys walking in front, and they were smoking. You can tell it. You can get a contact high almost. Yeah, yeah. Why, why punish people? Mm -hmm. They're not harming anybody. All right. Why, why do it? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Congressman Lewis, the youngest member of Congress right here. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. Good to see you. I was the first person to be hit. I was hit in the head by a state trooper with a nightstick. I thought I saw death. I thought I was going to down that bridge. I thought it was my last nonviolent protest. And all these many years later, I don't recall how I made it back across that bridge to the church. I do recall being in the church. They asked me to say something to the audience. And I stood up and said something like, I don't understand it. Now President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam. And can I send troops to Selma, Alabama to protect people who only desires to register to vote? When sorry is not enough. Enough said. Call Ed. EdBernstein.com.